So let's uh, let's get started. Um, so as all, I'm going to start uh, with announcements and reminders, and I also managed to figure out this thing. I hope it's not echoing through the room. Um, this homework zero on Canvas. Um, it's supposed to be easy. Um, it's got 20 questions. Uh, you get two attempts. And in case you feel like you need a refresher, uh, there are resources. There's a resources page on the course website that might help you out. Um, there's also an optional survey on Canvas. Some of you have already filled it in. Thank you so much. It's optional. You don't need to. But uh, if you do, I would appreciate it. Uh, and there's also a waiting list. There's still a waiting list for the class. The class is there's some spots of that uh, some, some spots did open up and I did send out permission codes to grad students. Um, so, but there's still some people who are uh, in the wait list. I think for undergrads, there's like a couple of spots that opened up. And since I don't manage undergraduate waiting lists, I don't know what's going on there. So you should uh, either try to register on your own or get in touch with the undergrad advisor if you can't do that. Um, any questions about any of these things? Not uh, another announcement is uh, just a, a couple of clarifications about uh, programming homeworks from the previous lecture. Um, there will be programming home uh, uh, assignments in the um, uh, through the class, and you are not allowed to use any machine learning libraries, which means you can't use uh, um, PyTorch or TensorFlow or JAX or Scikit-Learn or any of those things because you will be actually building those things. Some of I mean that could like a pretty tiny version of those things. And uh, on the other hand, you are welcome to use libraries for linear algebra uh, and data manipulation. So if you're familiar with NumPy, for example, you're allowed to use that. If you're familiar with Pandas, you're allowed to use that. Um, the other uh, uh, thing that uh, I wanted to mention is you can only use uh, languages and libraries that are already installed in CADE. I do not want to have my TAs uh, install new libraries and compile things uh, to be able to grade your submissions. Uh, and you, you shouldn't be needing anything outside of what's available in CADE. Um, any questions? And uh, so there's a question. Is there somewhere, there's a question on, uh, um, two questions on uh, on Zoom. First one is, will this lecture be available as a, on a YouTube playlist? It will be uh, sometime this evening, I'll be creating the playlist and I'll post it on, uh, I'll post the details both on the class website and uh, on Canvas. Um, and then there's another question on, uh, is there some place that lists libraries? I actually don't know what libraries are installed on Cade. Um, you figure it out the way you normally do with Python. You can, uh, um, I forget what it is, but there's like some list. If you have some trouble with that, uh, I think uh, the TS can help you out. I do believe that NumPy is installed. I do believe Pandas is installed. Um, so uh, are my TAs around? Uh, yes. Ah, okay. So uh, we'll figure it out and uh, you can, yeah, pip list. Thank you. Uh, so pip list will tell you what's installed. If this uh, is, um, if you're using Python, that's all you need. If you're using some other language, I don't know what's installed. Um, I'm sure you can figure it out, and uh, uh, I'm sure my TAs will be very happy uh, about having to compile C++ code. Um, one more. Uh, uh, any other questions? Are there other questions on where can I find the optional survey that I mentioned earlier on Canvas? If you go to quizzes, uh, it, it should show up under the quizzes tab. Um, at least that's what it shows up for me, but uh, I'm not looking at it from the student's view. If any of you uh, can confirm or deny, okay, there's a thumbs up, so it's on the quizzes tab. There are other questions on Zoom and the TS can handle them. Um, one more announcement and then we'll get to the actual content. Um, tomorrow there's going to be an, uh, a campus-wide event called the Utah Data Science Day. Every now and then I advertise these things in the class because they may be relevant to people here. Um, so, um, uh, the, the Utah Data Science Day uh, is supposed to be an event that brings together people who are broadly interested in data science from across campus and uh, also some local companies. 
Uh, there will be research talks. There's going to be an industry panel on responsible data science. There will be uh, some tutorials on things like how to use CHPC, how to um, uh, how to poke language models, uh, how to build your TV, and uh, there's going to be a research and industry expo that's just like a you know a, a showcasing some interesting things that are happening. Uh, and also, there's going to be a keynote talk by uh, uh, Dr. Susan Gregorick, uh, who's uh, from NIH, the National Institute for Health. Um, uh, technically, there was some registration that you that emails that were sent out in December, but I presume that uh, nobody reads emails in December. Um, uh, you can register on uh, in on site, and there's breakfast at uh, nine a.m. And this is in the union. Feel free to uh, attend if uh, any of this seems interesting. There are details on that website. The QR code points to something relevant. Um, not exactly sure what it points to something relevant. It might be the actual data science, uh, the schedule for the data science day. Um, and uh, any, I, I expect there are there should be no questions about this, right? If there are, I will point you to that website. Let's see if there are uh, things on Zoom. Uh, homework zero will count towards your final grade. It counts, it's like uh, one or two percent of your final grade. All right, um, let's actually jump into uh, the first sort of a real lecture on machine learning. Um, today we're gonna uh, spend a fair bit of time um, establishing a shared vocabulary so that uh, for the rest of the semester, when I say things like a hypothesis space, both of us um, um, understand it to be the same thing. So we're going to look at the setup for supervised learning. In the last lecture, um, we saw what learning was. And the primary lesson from the last lecture is that the main goal of learning is generalization. To be able to do well the next time on a previously unseen uh, instance. Because if the goal is to do well on data that you've already seen, there's no point that, that doesn't offer you, offer any sort of an, uh, uh, any new capability. Uh, for example, if I tell you that I have an email spam detector that's 100% accurate on all the emails that I already have, but on new emails, I don't know, like tossing a coin. It's probably not a useful spam detector because I already know whether my existing emails are spam or not spam. So the ability to generalize to new instances is really the main uh, criterion that um, uh, that we need to focus on. And then we looked at the badges game, where we had these names and uh, uh, there are uh, pluses and minuses. Today, we'll be looking at a little bit more uh, of the badges game. And uh, we'll get into formalizing supervised learning, where I'll talk about all these things. We'll get there later. So let's revisit the badges game. Uh, just to remind you, um, I showed you this table of six names, and I said uh, some of these names have pluses, some of these names have minuses, and I used some rule that I'm not going. I was not going to share with you uh, on Tuesday. I used some rule to decide whether a name gets a plus or a minus, and several of you gave suggestions or gave me ideas for what I might have done, right? And then I pointed to you that uh, the full data is on the class website, and you can stare at it and try to discover the rule if you want. Um, but really, it's not the rule that matters. It's the uh, the label on the next uh, instance. So, are there uh, uh, like did people do this? Uh, any guesses? Yes. I couldn't find the data on the class website. I wasn't sure where it's at. You couldn't find. Okay. Did anyone find the data on the class website? You did. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's on the lecture page for lecture number one. So every lecture has a website, uh, has a page of its own. And uh, somewhere in the links for that lecture, very much near the slides, you'll find the uh, data. But those of you who did see the data, were there any guesses on what the label might have been or what the rule might have been? Did anyone see the data? One person did. You opened the file. Did you take a guess? What? Yes? Uh, plus, if the second letter of the 
first and the last name are a consonant and a vowel, or a minus, but they're both vowels, or both consonants. I, 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 you're probably right, but I assure you, I did not think that hard. No, so today, uh, there's many novels that uh, have been lying as with a vowel as a second letter and a oh. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Oh, it, 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 so I'll tell you how I came up with the rules. I wrote a little program that tries out a whole bunch of rules and then uh, picks the big ones that are uh, that are roughly equal in pluses and minuses. Um, but the thing is, you know, with the complicated rule that I didn't quite get, you could have labeled Indiana Jones, right? I mean, I have no idea what the label will be because I didn't understand the rule. But uh, the rule that I actually did use was uh, if the penultimate letter of the last name is a vowel, it's a plus, otherwise it's a minus. Um, seems a little annoying because that seems, you know, it could have been any of the functions that fit the data. I just chose this. And the real question that I want, to, want you to think about is not, did you get this function right or not? Or is it possible for you to get the function right or not? But uh, um, even if you did get a function that fits the six data points, how can you be sure that it's correct? Let's say you get a function that fits all 200 data points and is perfect on them. How can you be sure that it's the rule that I used when I created the data? That's one question. How do you know whether you got the right answer? The second question to think about is, what learning algorithm did you use? What, what algorithm did you run in your head to discover that rule? You can, you know, even with those six uh, uh, examples, if you stared at it, you could have, you, there was some cognitive process that um, happened and you eventually ran an algorithm. So what algorithm was that? There are a few other learning issues to keep in mind. Um, uh, is this just modeling data or is this actually a prediction process where we are actually predicting for new uh, examples and is there even a difference between these two? Now, I'm not answering all these questions. I'm just kind of listing them out to kind of frame the rest of the semester. Another question that's actually quite interesting is how do you know you should look at the letters of the name? How do you know it's not about the sounds? How do you know it's not about something else about the name? I can't think of anything else right now, but how do you know it's about the letters? How do you know the, this concept of vowel that you mentioned? What's a vowel? I mean, I, I didn't give you that. Um, like the, the data doesn't tell you what a vowel is. Somehow you have come with some knowledge from home about what vowels are, what letters are and such things. And you're treating that as a given and then you're learning on top of that. So learning does not start, proceed in vacuum. It always builds on top of some knowledge. Um, so the problem with knowledge is that it's extremely large. How do you know what is the relevant piece of knowledge that applies to this particular uh, problem? For instance, how did you know that the day of the week uh, does not matter in deciding the rule, uh, the name? Uh, the, the label for the name. For instance, what if I say the, the label is plus if the last letter is, uh, the penultimate letter is a vowel and the day of the week starts with a T. So it works on Tuesdays and Thursdays or class days conveniently. Uh, somehow we also agree what is not relevant for this particular modeling problem. Um, and of course, the question is what learning algorithm are we using in our heads? And we don't know the answer to that, but uh, it's something interesting to think about. I'm not going to answer any of these questions right now because uh, hopefully as we go along through the semester, if you revisit these questions, you might have a better perspective of uh, which of these we can answer, which of these we kind of just take as a given, and which of these are essentially open questions. So the main item for today is supervised learning. Um, what is, uh, the, the, the goal, uh, the point of today's lecture is to introduce this notion of supervised learning. In the on Tuesday, when I asked people what uh, if people uh, have encountered supervised learning before, some subset of you said yes. Uh, I'm just going to formalize this. And if you've not encountered it before, we'll have running examples to kind of uh, uh, ground the formalization. So in fact, let's start with the running example. 
Um, imagine that you're running a newspaper, um, a newspaper, which is not, uh, you know, any newspaper has sections. There's a sports section, there's entertainment, there's politics, and uh, uh, finance and such things. Instead of the newspaper having sections where people write articles for the section, imagine that the newspaper is just this weird one where people write articles, and then there's a box that decides whether that article should go, is a finance article, or should it go into the politics section, or should it go into entertainment, or whatever. So a news article gets written first, and then gets classified into which section of the newspaper it goes into. The things that get classified are called instances. It's just a instance is a very vague name, but uh, that's the vocabulary that we we'll, that's the word we'll be using um, in the uh, in this class. Instances sometimes they are also called examples. These are objects to which some sort of a label will be assigned. And then there's a news labeling box. Article goes into that, and a label comes out. In this case, uh, maybe the label could be sports. So this article goes into the sports section. This is one newspaper article. But really, we don't care about this one thing. What we want is the set of all possible newspaper articles. Everything that has been written, everything that could be written in the future, this entire set of every article that might exist. Together, all of them form a set of instances that are called the instance space. The instance space gets mapped by some function that we hope gets learned into uh, one of the possible labels. The set of all possible labels is called the label space. Now, if you kind of stare at this bit a bit and think about it, what we have here is mathematically a function. We have a function that maps one set to another set. The set, the input to that function is called the instance space, and the output of that function is called the label space. I should uh, remember not to use my hands to point because people on Zoom can't see it. So. The set of uh, inputs to the learning algorithm is uh, to the uh, to the function that we hope gets learned is uh, the instance space, and the set of labels is the label space. So let's maybe let kind of uh, talk about instances and labels a bit. But feel free to ask questions. Feel free to raise your hand uh, if there are questions. The instance space typically um, uh, the letter X is used to uh, denote instances and instance spaces. So the instance space is the set of all examples that need to be classified. So it could be the set of all newspaper articles. In the badges game, the instance space consists of all possible names, not just the 200 names that were in the file, but every possible name that has not even been invented yet because our uh, function should be able to operate on any of those names. Um, instance, the instance space for uh, an image classification system consists of all possible images, or uh, uh, the instance space for a spam detector is all possible emails. So we have an instance space, typically the letter X. And then there's a label space. The label space consists of all possible labels. If you have a spam detector, the label space consists of just two things. This email is spam, or this email is not spam. Um, or it could just be plus or minus. We'll be working primarily with plus or minus or zero or one or true or false or something like that. The label space could also be real numbers. If I'm predicting a, a, a real valued output, the label space consists of all possible real numbers. So you're mapping, for instance, a, a, an image into a, 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 a point on the number line. And then, and uh, here's the, uh, the, the crux of it. We imagine that there's a target function. There is this oracle function that we don't actually get access to. We don't know what it is. This target function perfectly labels every instance X to its appropriate label Y. It does the right thing. It's an oracle. It's something that we don't have access to. Sometimes I'll call it nature. So this is the function that perfectly takes every image of a cat and says this is a cat and every image that's not a cat and says not cat and so we have the oracle for a cat detector every spam email gets perfectly classified as spam or uh, every email gets classified as spam or not spam uh, correctly by the oracle spam detector so this is the target function that we hope to discover this is the target function that we hope to find 
And the goal of learning is to search over every possible function that might exist. Every And when I say function, I mean this in a mathematical sense. The goal of learning is to search over every possible function that maps the instance space to the label space and try to discover this one target function, the mind of nature. Okay? This is the, in some sense, the sort of the ideal learning algorithm that searches over every possible function and finds that one hidden function that we don't get access to. Any questions before I move on? Yes. It has to search over every possible function? In the perfect case, in an ideal case. Okay. But I, I hear a little bit of skepticism in your voice. Do you want to elaborate on that? Oh, well, I mean, it's just impossible to look over every possible function. Does that mean? Just uh, it could, it doesn't have to be infinite. It could be finite. Imagine that uh, the set of all possible names. Uh, okay, names. Uh, let's say that uh, we have a finite, uh, uh, countably finite instance space. It's still going to be a large number. Yes. Yes. Well, you, there's no R right that it doesn't necessarily have to be like infinite because even with something like same as as we, while it's able to take energy, theoretical infinite amount of inputs, it still has a finite number of outputs based on type of inputs. Uh, That's the sense of the like model. It's not exactly being able to come up with a unique idea. It's just they able to come up with whatever it thinks is the most likely response. Ah, you're, you're introducing concepts of likelihood and such things, but there are there is a subtle, while on one hand, the direction in which you're thinking is correct, there is a subtle technical error in this very specific thing that you said that I'll, uh, I'll get to in a bit. Okay. It's not about instances and the labels that are finite. We need to think about the power set of that, it turns out. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. The goal of learning is to search over all possible functions. And if we had the perfect learning algorithm that is not hindered by computational constraints, that is not hindered by uh, silly things like time and space, um, this would be the thing that we would want to uh, uh, study. There is a question on uh, Zoom. Can there be more than one target function? Uh, for now, let's assume that there isn't. There could be in real life, but for now, let's assume that there isn't. However, the learning algorithm in the supervised se uh, setting does not actually see the target function. It does not have the target function. It only sees the target function in action on a finite number of examples. So what it sees is called the label's training set. It sees an instance x1 and the label assigned by f to x1, f of x1. It sees x2 and the label assigned by uh, f to x2. So you have a list of pairs. So here you have n of them. Together, these form the training set. It, it does not have a, a symbolic representation of the function. It only has the function, it only observes the function in action, and it does so n times. And all of these n training examples are tossed into a learning algorithm, which for now is a black box for us. And the learning algorithm produces a learned function, G. This is, uh, before I talk about anything about the learned function, already there's something super interesting here. The learning algorithm is a program that takes in data and returns a function. So it returns a function, so it's a higher order function, in some sense, those of you who are thinking of it that way. So the learning algorithm returns, produces a function. Essentially, the way to think about it is the learning algorithm takes the training data and returns its best guess of what the target function, the hidden target function might have been based on these n examples. This process, this represents the training phase um, of, the, um, of, the uh, of the experiment here. The training phase essentially takes a training set, throws it into a learning algorithm, and out comes the learned function. 
the learn function has the same signature as the target function. The learn function is also a function that maps inst instances to labels. It can also label all possible instances. Um, it may or may not be right. Any questions? Yes. This is a part that's different from unsupervised learning because the supervision here is the fact that we see F in action. In unsupervised learning, we don't see this part. We just see X1 through Xn, and essentially we are doing class spread. Yes. The target function is unknown. We can't, the target function is never given to the learning algorithm. We have instances where the target function has been applied. So for instance, we may have an email and spam or not spam, a collection of email with the associated labels. The true label, the true learning, the true function, the target function for a spam detector is the user's mind. Of course, we can't feed it into the function. Or uh, another uh, instance, another example of a label training set might be, um, let's say I'm observing the stock price of uh, Apple every day and deciding whether the, the goal is to predict whether the stock price goes up or down. And the way I construct the training data is I, I take the price today and all the relevant information, wait for tomorrow, get the label of whether it goes up or down, and then attach it to that. And that way I collect the list of pairs. I do not know actually what causes the stock to go up or down. I don't have access to that function. It's nature. N nature broadly defined, uh, as natural as the stock market is. But that's what it is. I do not ever have access to the true function, except the only place where I know that, where I have seen the target function being available is in homework questions. Um, anywhere else, we don't know, the, in any interesting situation, we don't have the target function. We only see it in action. Yes. So is there a point for us to be able to make the target function? Is there a point that, is there a point in fact to prove to have some kind of target function that we can fully just like? No, our goal is to discover an approximation of the target function, okay. namely P. Yeah. We may have seen something about this before, so just to, I guess the other idea is that we are thinking like a predefined set of training data, and then with that training data, we're feeding it to an algorithm that's hoping to get some sort of a function that while we may not know the function, the machine is able to use it to try and predict the future results. Well, the, we, we do know this function because it has been produced by the learning algorithm. We have access, that's actually a function that we can run on our system. G is a function that we have complete access to. F is a function we do not have access to. Our goal is to, our goal as people who design learning algorithms is to construct a black box that produces a good G as opposed to, uh, and a good G is one that uh, uh, the perfect, what would the perfect learn function be? Imagine that you had the perfect learning algorithm. What function would, uh, would that return? Sorry? R squared should be 1, 1. I don't know what R squared. Uh, the, the, which function will it return? Can you name the function? F. The function that is the perfect approximation of F is F itself. The ideal learning algorithm will return F, even though we, do, we may not know it. We don't have access to F, but in a perfect world, it will return F. So really, uh, the, it could, uh, we have to work with an approximation. This is not the only learning protocol. In the last lecture, we did see other ways in which this box here interacts with this function here. In the Supoy setting, it interacts with that function by seeing that function in action on a finite set of examples, the training set. Another protocol could be that learning algorithm takes an example, let's call it x n plus one, and a new example that has not been seen in this set before, and then goes directly to that function and says, hey, can you tell me what the label for that one? It picks the right example so that it, uh, it chooses, uh, it, it, so that it can discover that function faster. This protocol is called active learning. The learning algorithm can ask questions and 
uh, get sort of uh, data uh, data points so that its uncertainty is about the true function is resolved best. We will not be talking about active learning pretty much beyond this lecture and maybe the next one because uh, that's a complete, um, uh, it's, a, it's a different beast of its own. We'll be talking about supervised learning where uh, we have this, uh, uh, this way in which the learner interacts with us. Okay, so now we have the, now we have uh, a learn function. We have G that also maps uh, X to Y. And our goal is to discover how good this function is. I can give you, you know, I can give you a, a, a terrible learning algorithm. Here's a terrible learning algorithm. I take your data set, I completely ignore it, and say the label is always plus. I can do that, right? Probably for the most part, that particular algorithm is not going to be a good, uh, that, that particular function is not going to be a good one. Whereas some other function might actually be good. So clearly there are some functions that are better than others. And how do we know whether one function is better than the other? The way we evaluate G, because we do not have access to the target function. We still don't know the target function. The true function is always hidden from us. The way we evaluate G is we sample a random example, a test point from the instance space. We pick a random element of the instance space and we imagine that we have a process that allows us to apply F on it again. So we get the true label and we apply G on it and we ask, are these two the same? And if we have real numbers or some way of measuring distance between labels, we can ask how far away from the true label is. <laughs> and if you do that on one, one particular random sample, you might accidentally get the correct label. The, the, the function G might accidentally be correct because it just guesses plus and uh, just so happens that that one example uh, was actually a positive example. So instead of doing it on one, one test exam instance, you apply this procedure on many test examples and uh, uh, compute an aggregate score and accuracy for instance. How often is this correct? Or some sort of an average uh, error. How far away on an average is the prediction from the ground truth? We do this uh, on la la large enough test set and we assume that uh, this test set, if it is sampled independently, uh, sampled uniformly from the instance space, we get a, a, an estimate of how good this function is going to be on the entire test set. Questions about evaluation? Yes. Let me repeat the question. That's a good question. The question was, does the learning algorithm inside the black box on the previous slide um, work on the training examples one at a time? First it sees x1, then it sees x2, and so on. Or does it take the whole thing and does some, do something? With it? These are two different learning um, types of learning algorithms. Both of them exist. The first one that works on the examples one at a time, in fact, it's a little stricter than just one at a time. It works on the examples one at a time and then never returns to the, to the once it tosses away. It's called online learning. We'll look at online learning level. Um, the other approach where you take the full collection of training examples and do something with it by taking some aggregate statistics or whatever, is called batch learning. And we spend we, uh, quite a bit of time on batch learning as well. Batch learning, uh, today's most of today's learning algorithms uh, or successes of machine learning today tend to be batch learning because of practical reasons, not because online learning is any worse or better. It's just, well, not necessarily. Um, no, online learning is actually faster. Um, and uh, if there are formal, there are theoretical results that show that if something is learnable in online setting, it can it is also learnable in the batch setting. Uh, but there are uh, practical reasons for choosing batch because we usually have all the data. Online learning shows up when we have in the streaming setting. When we have a stream of examples, I don't have enough memory to hold the examples. I just see the example and I have to toss it out immediately if there are some constraints of that kind. Other questions about uh, instances, about target functions, learning uh, uh, the target function? Yes. Uh, 
That's a, that's a very good question. In fact, that's the question I had for you. The test examples are coming from the instant space, the same instant space. But can you test on the instances that the learning algorithm has already seen? No. Why not? Remember, as in remember, not an algorithm. Okay, that's a good answer. But uh, you you said. Is the same as that which could be They're the same Possibly, yes. Um, in fact, let me give you, uh, let me even kind of uh, give you an, a, a crazy learning algorithm that is, let, let me describe the learning algorithm. So the learning algorithm is uh, what I'm going to call the table learner. What it does, it sees the training data, loads it, puts every training example in a database. There are two columns in the, in the, in the table, the instance and the label. And the function G behaves in the following way. A new example comes in, G is a function. It should be able to operate on any instance from the instance space, right? So what it does is it first goes to the table and sees does any row in the table match the new example that comes along. If it does, then it returns the correct label. Otherwise, it just says plus or it just tosses a coin, or it just says minus. It does something that makes no sense. What would the training accuracy, what would the accuracy of that G be on the training set? 100%, 100 because it has essentially memorized the training set. What would the accuracy of that be on new examples? 50. It doesn't have to be 50. It is basically whatever is the majority label. I mean, the data doesn't have to be balanced. Mm -hmm. It's basically as good as a random guess. The worst any learning algorithm can ever do is random guessing. So, because if it's doing worse than random guessing, you know what I'll do? I'll take the output of the learning algorithm. If it says plus, I'll say minus. So I'm better than random. So the worst you can ever do is random guessing. And this particular table learner is guaranteed to do exactly that. And yet it's going to be perfect on the training set. Being perfect on the training set is called memorization. Doing well on future examples is called generalization. We don't care about memorization. We care about generalization. And so you cannot use test examples during the training phase. Because if you use test examples from during the training phase, our learning algorithm has an incentive to memorize them. Our learning algorithms have everything that we see in the class and things that we don't see in the class all of them have a tendency to memorize data as it is. So you want to not make sure that you don't use test examples during the training set, during the training phase. This is basically, uh, if you want a practical example of this, imagine that someone gives you the exam questions for a class before the exam. And then everyone gets 100% and the instructor says, wow, these people have learned so well. It makes no sense. So you never, ever, look at the test example, the, your, your learning algorithm never ever looks at the test example during the training phase. In fact, I would actually push it to a little bit uh, extreme. Not only should your learning algorithm not look at the test example, you as the person who's going to run the learn, uh, learner should not look at the test examples because the test labels might leak through your brain into the learning algorithm. Why? Because you might accidentally not intentionally, accidentally uh, introduce something new in your learner that is biased towards the test examples. So uh, I would encourage you, not just in this class, not for the homework and such things, but anytime you're applying machine learning, make sure that the test set is essentially kept completely separated. I used to suggest, and I still kind of think it's a good idea to uh, 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 put the test examples in a zip file and do not even write the code to load it until maybe one day before the final thing is due uh, because you, you, you should not even be tempted to look at the test examples. Otherwise, any conclusion you draw about G makes no, is no longer uh, uh, meaningful. You cannot conclude anything useful about G about the learned function if 
the test data contaminates the training data. So be very wary of uh, the training data being contaminated. So let me abstract everything that I said. Uh, I'm going to repeat the same thing that I just said, but use more uh, mathematical notation. We have training examples that are pairs of the form x comma f of x. Here, f is an unknown function, the function that we hope to learn. x, of course, is a training example. x is an input that comes out of the instant space. And typically, this is a new bit, typically x is represented as feature vectors. Feature vectors, vectors are just um, uh, points in a high dimensional space, or if you're not comfortable with that uh, idea of high dimensional spaces, think of them as a list of numbers. Um, for example, you could have a, a Boolean feature space, just zero or one, a vector of them, B of them, or a collection of B real numbers. And for the most part, um, at least at the very, the, the, the input to this function, is a deterministic mapping from the instances in your problem, like news articles or names or images or whatever, to some vector space, to features. So, the and the, the label assigned to this x is uh, f of x, which is uh, uh, which comes from the label space. The goal of learning is to use the training set that we have to find a good approximation of f. Before I move on, are there questions? One question that uh, that often comes to some students at this point is, what is a vector? Vector is not a matrix. Um, we, well, you could, but uh, for the purposes of this class, I want you to think of it as a list of numbers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we will start with that and kind of uh, uh, work our way up. If you start talking about vector spaces and such things, suddenly things get more complicated. Um, and whenever I say high dimensional uh, features or high dimensional vectors or high dimensional space, think many lists, many numbers in that list. Because uh, that's really what it is. I mean, we, we will we will eventually start thinking about these points from a, these uh, vectors from a geometric perspective. And it becomes very useful and it ends up uh, uh, relevant for proving theorems and such things. But for now, just a list of numbers. Yes. Yes. Ah, that's another good, uh, that's a good question. So the question was, what is the deterministic mapping from instances in your problem? So let's, uh, let's take the concrete example that we had. We have news articles and I need to convert news articles into, um, um, into a label. News articles are just strings, if you're lucky. They might be um, images, but let's say they're strings or they're HTML or a PDF or something like that. These are objects that have meaning in the real world. The feature vectors are vectors in the vector space. The, det the deterministic mapping here takes the objects that are of interest, that are inputs to the problem, like news article, and converts them into uh, the mathematical representation, namely of features, that the uh, the the function that we are that we would like to learn can then operate on. So it's a fixed mapping. It's a, the, this mapping is pre-decided by the person who's going to employ this uh, uh, learning app. And we'll be talking about features in a bit. And this is a point that if you've not seen before, it's a little bit. Uh, Tricky. It turns out it's actually not tricky, uh, um, but it becomes super important. And I'll talk about that uh, in a bit more detail in a short way. Yes. So, that could be the feature. That could be, and the choice of feature is a design choice. 
you could do something else. You could say that, oh, I don't uh, really care about the color. I'm going to use black and white. So it's just, you don't need RGB. It's just one, uh, you know, one number. You don't need black and white. You just need whether there is, uh, is this foreground or background? It's just a single bit, the grid of bits. So it's, it's a choice. And you don't need, maybe we don't want to work with matrices. We want to flatten them into vectors and suddenly you have this object here. Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. That's a good example. Yes. Was there a question at the back? Uh, yes. Yeah, this is a different kind of randomization. Here I'm talking about guessing the label by essentially tossing a coin. You can't do worse than that because that you there is by tossing a coin with that complete that's essentially unbiased. And you randomized algorithms are far more complicated than that. Okay. I didn't talk much about the label, but let's very briefly talk about the label. The label decides what kind of a problem you have. If the label space has two things in it, then we call it a binary classification problem. If the label space has a finite number of things, but more than two, we call it a multi-class classification problem. If the label space consists of all possible real numbers, we call it a regression problem. People may have seen linear regression before. The label space for linear regression is real numbers. There's a question? Yeah. So if I'm, for example, trying to predict like how to that, okay. uh, what's the kind of giving to uh, if I want a label space to like a brain and a lock, uh -huh. brain and a lock, or like a probability of a certain way? How do I determine like which brain and a lock? For now, let's say it's win or loss. Eventually, uh, and sometime when we talk, when we get to the part uh, of uh, uh, on Bayesian learning, I'll change the game a bit and say the label space is the probability of win or loss. But for now, let's say it is just win or loss. Are there questions about um, this general um, setting? And you, I, I recognize that from a lot of this might seem unnecessarily detailed. This is mostly to kind of establish a shared vocabulary. While you're thinking of questions, let me give you some examples of binary classification. Just to remind you, binary classification is uh, the case where you have two things in the label space, a plus or a minus, zero, one, two, false, win, loss, what have you. So span filtering is a, uh, is a simple, is a common example. The input, the instant space consists of all possible emails. The label space consists of span or not span. You can frame recommendation systems as a binary classification problem. Given the user preferences and a particular movie, will the user like the movie or not like it? Thumbs up or thumbs down. So the instant space consists of the cross product of all possible users and all possible movies. Because we pick a user, we pick a movie and feed it into the box and it predicts thumbs up, thumbs down. You can frame anomaly detection uh, as uh, a binary classification problem. So uh, uh, a few years ago, a class project for this class was uh, predicting whether an Android app is malicious or not. Um, malicious or not, two labels, binary classification. Um, another class project was authorship identification, given two documents, were they authored by the same person or not? Uh, this is not authorship identification, it's more of testing, but still, let's not. Uh, now well, you can certain problems that are not naturally that don't feel like binary classification can be forced to look like binary classification as well. So uh, the stock price example that I mentioned before fits that uh, uh, that uh, template. Will the price of the stock go up or not? So in all cases, the label space consists of one of two decision points: either plus minus, up down, spam not spam, win loss, um, malicious not malicious, or so on. So whenever we are employing um, supervised learning, whenever we want to do that, we need to be able to decide, answer a bunch of questions. We need to know what are instant spaces. In other words, we need to be able to tell 
what the inputs to the program to the learn function will be, and also uh, what the features are. We need to be able to decide, determine what the label space is, which essentially decides what the prediction task is. Because if you know what the prediction task is, you have the label space. We also need to decide a few other things, but those other things are a little bit more complicated. Uh, I'll just briefly mention number three. Uh, I mentioned, I said learning is search over functions. We need to search over the space of all possible functions to find the one that we hope is the right one. The, anytime you have a search problem, we need to define the search space. That search space for the search process is called the hypothesis space. And so what functions is our learning algorithm going to look at? It's the hypothesis space. We'll spend a, each of these questions, we'll kind of dive into uh, a bit more. And then, of course, there's the question of, we have defined the hypothesis space. What is the search algorithm? Calling it a search algorithm seems a little lame. So let's give it, make it more fancy. What's our learning algorithm? How is our, how are we going to uh, explore the hypothesis space to find the best one using the labeled data that we have? And finally, we also need to decide what is success? How do we know whether our, uh, the learned function is good or bad? So what is the evaluation method? We need to be able to answer all of these things before we actually run any code. Let's go into uh, what each one of these in detail. Let's focus on the instance space X, which is just this thing here. The really uh, the, the main two main things. Did you have a question? Let's go back. Um, the, there are two things we need to do to when we are thinking about the instance space. The first one is we need to know what our inputs to the learning pro uh, process are. So the, a good example here is that recommendation example uh, uh, thing that I said. I said the recommendation system decides whether a user likes a movie or not. The instance space consists of a pair of user and movie because both of those need to go into the box to get a plus or a minus. So we need, uh, in the newspaper article example, the instance space consists of all possible newspaper articles. But the other, perhaps the more important and interesting question when we are thinking about the instance space is to design an appropriate feature representation. Instances, as I said, are defined in terms of their features. And one way to think about features is uh, think of them as sensor readings. So I need to classify whether a certain instance belongs to a certain uh, uh, class or not. That particular instance, I need to take measurements from so that that instance is completely characterized in terms of those measurements. All those measurements together are the features. Um, so for instance, uh, imagine that I'm, uh, I have a learning problem where I need to decide based on the sound produced by a car, and any vibrations in the car, whether the car is uh, needs service right now or not. I don't know why you would do that, but uh, let's say that that's the learning task. And the way I'm going to measure and take the measurement is I'm going to use my phone, place it on the dashboard, and record sounds, accelerometer, vibrations, and all those things. All of those measurements are your features. You pile them all up together, you get a vector. So I can measure accelerometer, uh, readings, I can take the sound, I can manipulate the sound uh, uh, volume and intensity and all those things and uh, you know apply mathematical functions, deterministic functions to them because I'm, I'm essentially taking measurements. So the, 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 the one way, another way to think about it is uh, imagine that you have a robot that's kind of walking around and doing things by, uh, by interacting with the world. This robot has to engage with the world by taking measurements from the world, right? It bumps into something, a certain uh, um, sensor goes off. It they, uh, has a, a distance uh, thing that it measures from, uh, it measures the distance to the closest obstacle on multiple directions. Each of those is a sensor reading. All of those together form features. The reason I'm kind of giving you multiple examples here is because the design of feature is very much, very, very much tied to the problem that you have. In the badges game, for example, the letters form the features, could form the features. Features could be boolean. Um, for a spam detector, 
a good feature might have been, might be still, does the email contain the word free in big bold letters? Features could be real value. Right? What's the height of a person? What's the stock price they bought? Um, features could be handcrafted or features themselves could be the output of a learning process. One way or another, we need to have access to the features before we employ our learning algorithm on the uh, input. The features, the feature vectors are the learning algorithms or the, the learned functions view of the instances. Does this answer your question about uh, the deterministic map? Okay, but this is the answer to that question. <laughs> so a little bit more about this. So you have the input of the problem and we need to map it into a feature vector. And sometimes I use the phrase uh, feature function to uh, uh, describe that mapping. And sometimes they are also called feature extractors. Um, they are typically deterministic, but they could also be learned. And um, one way or another, they convert any example that you have, any instance that you have, into high dimensional uh, vectors. The, the, the design of features and the choice of the features that uh, uh, you, you use for a learning problem is an incredibly important design choice. Uh, because if you get the right features, learning is actually super easy. If you get the absolute wrong features, learning can potentially be important. How do you know whether you got it right? I don't know. You try. Question. In this space where if you were implementing dimensionality or not, some people's references were huge. This is where you're going to do that. This could be one place to do it. Yes, that's right. If you are doing any sort of dimensionality reduction. Yep. The features are supposed to capture everything. Oh, there's a question on Zoom. How do we know if we have enough features to find the target function? We never know the answer to that. Um, we think hard about the problem and we write down the answer and hope it's right. Um, there's, there's a, alternatively, there's also the problem of, there's also the, you can also frame this whole thing as the problem of learning the feature functions themselves. Mm -hmm. And in fact, some of the biggest advances in machine learning in the last maybe 10, 15 years have been because we have decided that let's try to learn the feature functions. When we start learning feature functions, then that learning problem is going to have feature functions also. Why not learn them too? We keep doing that and we get what are called deep neural networks. But we'll get there eventually. We ne the discovering the right features is a non-trivial uh, problem. Uh, and often it ends up becoming a bit of an art. Features are supposed to capture, uh, yes. Can you just try to understand, like, your instance, like an instance would be like a decision analysis. Right? Yes, so yes. And your feature would be like your vectorized feature? Yep. Okay. Yep, that's right. So, uh, the, the way in which, uh, the, the reason features are important is because the learning algorithm and the functions that they learn know nothing about the instances except what's in the features. So if the features contain the right information, whatever it might be, then your learning algorithm at least has a chance to succeed. If they do not contain that information, there's no hope. And, you know, sometimes we may not have the right features. Sometimes we may think a certain, a certain attribute is important and add it to the feature set and it turns out it's actually a bad feature and it serves to confuse the learner. This this can and do happen. Yes. Do you have some methodology to evaluate the feature? No, not uh, there are, but not uh, nothing that is simple enough to answer in uh, the second lecture of a machine learning class. <laughs> um, yeah, a feature function is just a function that takes an instance and converts it to a feature. And takes an instance and converts it into the vector space. So, what might be some feature functions? What might be some features for the badges game? Number of letters in each name is a good uh, is is a potentially useful feature. 
Sorry? For each letter. So a Boolean for every letter, whether it's a vowel or a constant, consonant, yes. The number of consonants or vowels. The number of consonants or vowels. The first, yes, one more. Whether there's a middle name. Oh, wow, I didn't think of that, but that's an interesting one. Yeah. So you can, so each, I hope you're getting the, uh, the, the idea. You're inventing features without actually knowing what the target function is because you don't know what the target function is. But what else can you do? You don't know what the target function is. You try your best to uh, to kind of cover the space. Did you have a question? Uh, we're just trying to find things that all of our infant space has in common. Possibly, or something that you know about the problem. Okay. Um, let's say that uh, I'll give you an example of a good feature and a bad feature for deciding whether, uh, um, let's say, um, an email is time or not. A good feature might be um, some information about the word free in it because spam emails, I think, and they used to many decades ago advertise free things. So uh, maybe that's a good feature. A bad feature might be is this email sent on a day when there is no outside? Why is that a bad feature? Possibly because we have some sort of a understanding that that particular piece of information may not be relevant for deciding whether the email is found out. Yes. Uh, it could be if you're, if you want to learn it, otherwise it's determined. Um, feature functions convert inputs to vectors. So essentially because feature functions are assumed to be given for the purposes of this class. As far as we are concerned for this class, we won't be talking about emails and uh, images and um, names and such things. We'll only be talking about inputs are high dimensional vectors. Let's pretend that the feature extraction has been done yesterday. Um, and every dimension is one feature. So X, the instance space essentially is a vector space. Every instance in the vector in the feature space in the instance space corresponds to a particular vector. Each vector is a point in, uh, has D elements, it's a D dimensional space. And once again, D dimensional vectors tend to kind of thinking of D dimensional spaces, if you think hard enough about it, is guaranteed to give anyone a headache. Um, I'll get to you in a minute. Um, D dimensional spaces are just like two dimensional spaces. Mm -hmm. Uh, except D equals, in this case, D equals two. A single point here is um, uh, defined by, in this case, this point here is defined by X1 and X2, two numbers. In D-dimensional spaces, that point is defined by D numbers. It's a point in a high dimensional space. I can't draw three dimensions on the whiteboard, but you can imagine three dimensions in this room. Questions? Uh, there was a question there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they approximate F together. No. Yes, yeah, you're, you're right. They approximate F together. Yes, that's right. There's something like a few Unfortunately, not. Because if you knew that, then you know something about yeah. the task. Then you know something about the hidden function. Every time you want to think about questions of that kind, imagine what all information may be relevant for predicting a stock price. You don't know. I mean, it might be very, very complicated things. Can I give you a small example? Um, there was a hedge, there was a hedge fund uh, in the 2000s that tried to predict the price of coffee, a coffee stock, and the what the information that it used in the machine. It was a machine learning system. Uh, the information that it used was the weather reports in Ethiopia in 
uh, in, in a certain time of the year. The actually cloud cover in Ethiopia at a certain time of the year. And based on that, it was using that information to predict whether the coffee price of Starbucks will go up or down. Why? Because Ethiopia grows coffee if there's a lot of rain. I don't know. More rain, less rain, one of those is a bad thing. And uh, that affects co the co price of coffee. That affects how much Starbucks has to spend. Notice how complicated this is. So basically what the hedge fund did is to predict Starbucks coffee price. It bought satellite data on Ethiopia. And it turns out that it made like a tiny uh, improvement in the accuracy and it made the hedge fund like millions of dollars for a few months. So, you know, it's a it's the design of features can is itself an intellectual exercise. It could be a creative exercise. Yep. Can you decide to include a bunch of good features uh, as well as a bunch of bad features? Mm -hmm. um, are learning algorithms good at sifting out which ones are useful and which ones are bad? Or is it better for us to ensure that we're only good features? Unfortunately, Adding more and more bad features end up ends up confusing learning algorithms, and uh, the reason for that is we only have a finite number of training examples, and so you might be able to fit any kinds of pattern in the noise, in the in the bad features. As a result, uh, adding more and more bad features tends to decrease performance. Uh, in two thousand and three or five or something, there was a shared challenge to the machine learning community, such as it was then where the task was, we have a certain hidden function and uh, we know what it is. We created the data ourselves. We have, I don't know, we, they, the, we have some number of valid features and we've added a, a few orders of magnitude more invalid feature, irrelevant features that are just random. And the challenge was find the target function without knowing which are the uh, good and bad features. And if memory serves me right, nobody got more than 55% accuracy on it, even though it was equally balanced. And in theory, there was hundred. There was a function that uh, could have gotten 100% because the invalid, the bad features confused all the learning algorithms of that time and still do. There was a question, yeah. So do you know I have the exact same features No, it depends on which learning algorithm we have and many, Learning algorithms today have randomness inside them, so uh, not necessary. The the randomness also uh, you know, plays a part. Okay, um, we talked about the features for the badges game. So think. So let me give you one example here. Um, you can one one feature for the badges game could be the second letter of the some name of the name. So for the name Manning. The feature pulls out the letter A. So this is the thing. But typically, we don't. The letter A is not uh, an element of a vector space. What we end up doing is we convert it into an encoding that looks like this. This encoding is called a one-hot encoding. It puts a one in the first position and a zero everywhere. The letter B for A, the letter B puts a one in the second position and a zero everywhere. C is a one in the third position and so on. So this is the standard way to convert a, a finite discrete set of categories into a vector, uh, vector representation. How many features, what would the dimensionality of this, these vectors be? 26, there are 26 parts and exactly one of them might be um, relevant. Did I not answer that question? How do we know what's a good feature and what's a bad? I, I think I did answer that question in class. So we have 26 uh, possible letters and each letter can be uh, um, corresponds to one position being a one and everything else being here. First you then, yeah. Uh, uh, we could, I, I absolutely, yes. we could. Um, possibly the second letter of the name is not capitalized, but yeah, we could have 52. We could have more, many more if you throw in Unicode as well. But then it's not like you want to present and decide if you want to decide, like you want to be capital or these letters. That's a choice. That's a design choice. Design choice is not the same. Yeah, that's a design choice. Yes. Yeah, yeah, in statistics, uh, you would call these dummy values. Yeah.
So we have 26 features, and these are one hot uh, vectors where exactly one dimension, one of the elements is one, and everything else is zero. One hot vectors keep showing up in machine learning uh, as an initial encoding for a lot of problems. Features could also be real values. So uh, an example is the length of the name. Um, Naoki is has five letters. It has a single, a one-dimensional vector. What's a one-dimensional vector? A number. One-dimensional vector is a very complicated way of saying a real number, just a number. So this feature is one-dimensional. Mm -hmm. But I could also kind of have multiple features together. I want to consider the second letter of the name, the length of the name, and the length of the uh, first name and the last name. I concatenate them all together. So now I have, uh, for this particular name, the second letter of the first name is this part of the vector. The length of the first name is here. The length of the second name is here. I just keep stacking them up. I get larger and larger vectors. So features can be accumulated to form bigger feature vectors by, uh, by concatenating them. So the dimensionality grows, uh, grows, uh, uh, keeps increasing. In this case, the dimensionality, assuming only lowercase letters, would be 28. So good features are extremely important. Uh, bad features can break the learning process. As a result, a lot of effort goes into designing good features or learning them. And uh, Unfortunately, the design of features is not something that is uh, generalizable across applications, across domains. And so we'll touch upon some good some principles on designing good features, uh, but it really is domain specific, task specific. And so it comes with experience and often that's where um, uh, we, need to, we need to kind of have some knowledge about the task. That's all I have to say about instance spaces. And we've had like a good discussion. So I'm not going to pause for questions. We have six minutes left and I want to quickly talk about label spaces. That will set us up nicely for uh, a discussion on hypotheses uh, 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 next week. So the label space is uh, typically denoted by the letter Y. And it's the set of all possible labels that the learning problem has to, uh, uh, that are in the learning problem. And the label space depends on uh, the kind of the problem that we have. The, if, the label, if the label space consists of uh, a list of categories, we call this a classification problem. Why the classification is when, as I said, we have uh, the two possible labels. Multi-class classification is k possible labels. Um, when k equals 2, we are back to binary classification. We will definitely spend a lot of time on binary classification because many of the ideas that develop in machine learning seem to first start off in binary classification. And there are standard generalizations to other things. So we'll spend a lot of time talking about binary classification. If time permits, we'll talk about multi-class classification. Uh, but uh, the output can be categorical, but also infinitely large with uh, you know the graph uh, value outputs probably or structured outputs that's called structured prediction the different class that I sometimes teach um, classification is the main focus of this class uh, because I know that uh, many of you read learn about regression in other places so we'll be spending a lot of uh, time on classification and I did say regression if the output space is a number we call this reg a regression problem. The label space consists of all possible real numbers, or maybe a subset of real numbers. When I say subset, maybe all numbers between 0 to 1. These things are regression problems. The labels could also be ranking. Um, so in this case, the labels are, uh, the, the task may involve ranking, uh, such as uh, uh, a Yelp review. Imagine that uh, the, the or an online review it doesn't have to be Yelp. Um, Imagine that the task involves reading a review and predicting a star rating. If there are five possible ratings, let's say one, two, three, four, five. It may seem like there are, it's a finite class, it's a finite list, and there are uh, exactly five things, and it seems to fit this bucket, multi class. There are k possible labels, in this case, k equals five, but it's more than just k possible labels. The label of one star is closer to two star than it is to five. So there's like a distance between these things. 
different labels are some labels are closer to each other than others. So there's an ordering over the labels, and this kind of a problem is called a ranking problem. Um, the label space, these are just different names that are assigned to the modeling problems based on the kind of uh, label space that is. So this is pretty much all I have to say about label spaces, actually. Um, there's not too much. It's just, you know, there are the different types of labels. We'll be spending, we'll look at regression a little bit. Uh, we'll look at um, binary classification quite a bit. If time permits, we'll look at multi-class classification. Um, let me briefly, in the two minutes that are left, let me leave you with a little puzzle. Yeah. So I said learning is search over all possible functions, right? Learning is search over functions. Imagine that uh, I have two inputs and one output, and I have this, um, I have a training set that looks like this. So there are, these are the inputs and these are the labels. One means true, zero means false. Can you guess what this function is? It's an and. What that means is uh, if x1 and x2 is one, the label is one. Otherwise, the label is zero. That's good. Okay? I'll leave you with this one. There are four inputs and one output, and I have these seven examples. Can you guess what the function is? Is this, right? is this what you are guessing? Oh, oh. I claim Using this example, I can show that machine learning is impossible. I'm not going to tell you why, because we are out of time, but I'll leave you with this puzzle. Try to come up with this function without looking at the next few slides.